So I remember when I, when I was just praying that, this dream came back to me that I had years ago uh, as I was praying, let your word go out and anoint, uh, is when the Lord, Lord first was calling me to preach, um, and, and I was resisting. And uh, he showed me um, me preaching with absolutely nothing to support or, or help. I, I wasn't prepared. And, and I, I agreed and I stood up and I spoke one word and, 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 then, and that's all I could think of. And so I stood there and, and then I spoke a couple of words and then I, I said a whole sentence and I just would begin to speak just as he would give it to me. And every time his word was spoken, it would go out and something would happen in, in the people. Somebody would get saved, somebody get healed, somebody would be uh, filled with the Spirit, whatever was happening, but there, there, were, there was you know, repentance. Or his word accomplishes, it will not return void, will it, Miss Carol? It will not return void. And so today is no different, although we're almost 30 years later, uh, today is no different from that. His word is what it is anointed and what finds its way to the hearts. I'm going to mess it up. I'm just a guy. Um, I'm, I'm going to do my best to be obedient and hear his voice and his leading today. Um, but regardless of my weaknesses or failures, he's strong. Amen. Uh, if you would turn your Bible to uh, Hebrews chapter 4. Speaking of the word, um, here's a scripture in, uh, in the fourth chapter of Hebrews. Um, that is, um, has been, uh, well, I'm going to be at the end of the chapter, but at the beginning part of the chapter, and we talked about this a few weeks back, about the rest that remains for God's people. Uh, those who walk in obedience to Him, those who walk in submission and surrender to Him, there is a rest that is for His people. And I, if, if you were here for that and you recall, uh, I talked about how that rest was not a, a relaxation period. It wasn't a time to coast or take it easy in any way. Um, it is actually an obedience that leads to a greater reward. So that's what that rest is referring to, an obedience that leads to a greater reward. So we have a confidence in, 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 the, in the Lord. We have a confidence in His Word, and we surrender to that so we surrender our wills to that, and uh, it, it leads us to a greater reward. Let me just start reading in verse 8. I'm, I'm getting down to verse 14, actually. But for Joshua, if Joshua had given them rest, God would have spoken, would not have spoken about another day. Therefore, a Sabbath rest remains for God's people. For the person who has entered his rest has rested from his own works, just as God did from his. Let us then make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall into the same pattern of disobedience. For the word of God is living and effective and sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrating as far as the separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It is able to judge the ideas and the thoughts of the heart, no creature is hidden from him, but all things are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Verse 14 says, since, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to the confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tested in every way as we are yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us at the proper time. Speaking of that, the, the, the word of God, backing up to verse 12 for just a moment, the word of God is sharp. The word of God is living. It is effective, sharper than any double-edged sword penetrating as far as a separation of, of soul and spirit, joint and marrow, able to judge the ideas and the thoughts of the heart, and none is hidden from it, and all are naked and exposed in God's eyes. The Word of God 
is the most powerful, single most powerful thing you will ever experience in your life. The word, as Miss Carol just said, will not return void. When it is spoken, it will not return void. The word of God moves mountains. The word of God changes lives. The word of God applied to my heart and me walking, walking in obedience to that word brings rest to me. So it brings a greater reward. It brings a peace to me. It's something that I can hold on to. It's something that is immovable in an ever-changing world, in a world where things are, are fluid and constantly moving and constantly changing so fast and we have record of it so much so that it's almost impossible to keep up with everything that is changing, with everything that is happening in our world. But one thing that we can know is unchanging, and that is the Word of God. And that is what I hold fast to. That is what, and when, when, when the, he's, the writer here says, says, hold fast to that confession. I know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I know my God as being faithful. I know uh, his ways as being unchanging. I know that he changes not from the beginning to the end. There is nothing that changes about him. And it is stable. It is secure. It is strong. It always has been and always will be. And that's the confidence that I have, Brother Eric. That's the confidence and the boldness that I have. That when my world looks like it's turning upside down, that when my world looks like the enemy has come in and he's just had a heyday and doing what he wants to do with, with wreaking havoc in my world, I can be steady, I can be constant, I can be sure, I can be bold. I know that I have the grace of God. I know that I have his mercy. I know that I have everything that, per, that, that comes from him that pertains, as Peter said, to life and godliness. And that is the strength that I have. That's what keeps me secure. That's what keeps me moving on, keeps me moving forward. That keep, that's what has kept Deb and I in ministry for all these years is the word of God, the promises of God that are sure, that are yes and amen, as the scripture says. And if I look to anything else, if I leaned on anything else, I would surely fall. If I looked to my circumstances, I would surely fail. If I looked to my health, I would go just as quickly as it goes. If I looked to my strength of my years, I would wane spiritually as quickly as my muscles and my, and my ligaments wane physically. But if I look to Him, if I keep my gaze upon Him, if I keep my, my heart fastened and, and locked in with His, then I can know that there is nothing, nothing, absolutely 100%, nothing at all that can happen in my life that he has not brought into my life for a good purpose, that he has not ordained for his reasons, that he has not allowed, that he has not caused. The scripture says in Isaiah that he created the smith that blows the coals and he created the waster to destroy. Those are the promises that we have from our God. He creates this fire in me. He creates this, this, this storm and he brings me through the storm. Speaking of the storm, let's look a little bit later in that, in that uh, passage where we read there at the end in that scripture that is so famous to everybody. Uh, after, after the writer says, we don't have a priest who's unable to sympathize in our weakness, but the one has been tested in every way as we are yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness. There are times, church, when we, the only thing we have that would resemble a solution to a problem is simply in our tattered state, in our weakened state, in our fearful state, is to approach the throne of grace. Sometimes I think we approach the throne of grace with, with apology. We approach the throne of grace with wonder as to whether or not this is gonna do any good. Sometimes I think we approach the throne of grace with more fear than we've ever had in our life. God, are you going to let me die? God, are you going to let us suffer? God, are you going to let this continue? God, are you going to let these take over this country or this nation and bring, bring it to destruction? God, are you going to... And, and we come to His throne with as much doubt as we have ever had in our life 
But he, he, he commands us. He, 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 he is beckoning us through this scripture to approach that throne, Monty, with boldness. When we go to the throne, we go upright. When we go to the throne, we go looking to our Father because we know we have been given grace. We know we've received mercy. We know that in us dwells no good thing, right? But we know except for the Jesus that's living on the inside of us, we would be utterly cast out. But because of the Jesus that lives on the inside of us, I am in no wise cast out. I am in no wise defeated. I am actually, because of what I know, according to this word that is sharp and penetrates deep to the dividing of soul and spirit, I actually know that the Jesus that lives on the inside of me has made me more than a conqueror. That he's made me good enough. That he has actually made me the righteousness of God. Doesn't the scripture tell us that? That we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Now, if I know that's who I am, why would I come with my head down to the throne? If I know that I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, why would I go with my tail tucked between my legs? Why would I go with an apologetic spirit? Why would I go with a wimpy little prayer? Why wouldn't I go with confidence and boldness saying, God, the armies are far greater than me. God, they're right on my tail. You know that. God, they're about to destroy me. They're about to take everything from me. God, I don't have anything left. I have no strength. I have no, no peace. The enemy has robbed me, but I come to you with confidence and with boldness because I know you're my faithful, loving Heavenly Father who will restore all things that the enemy would have used to destroy me. And I go with that confidence. I go with that peace. I go with that surety. All right, listen, I, I was trying to get to something and I got off on a, on a sidetrack. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help at the proper time. Wow. This word right here. That if I go to the throne of grace with boldness so that I may receive mercy. Now remember the difference between grace and mercy? Somebody tell me what's the difference between grace and mercy. Grace is what? Y'all been here long as I have. You know this stuff. <laughs> grace is when you get what you don't deserve. Mercy is when you don't get what you do deserve. Right? Great. Now, y'all going to have to remember that. I'm going to ask you again next week if I can remember it. Grace is when you get what you don't deserve. Mercy is when you don't get what you do deserve. I get, every day, I get things I don't deserve. I get the peace of God. I get the joy that passes all understanding. I get peace that passes understanding. I get a confidence in knowing that I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I get the, 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 the encouragement to know that all things are working together for my good. I get the, the strength to know that nothing is going to come my way that's not common to man, but God will make a way of escape and, and I'll be able to overcome the temptation. I know all of these things and I, I have this grace that comes to me every day. And I also know that I receive mercy every day because Lamentations tells me that his mercies are new every morning, right? So every morning that my eyes pop open, Brother Chris, every morning that I wake up and take a breath and I'm able to stand up and I feel a few aches and pains and I shake one out and I shake the other one out and then I try to shake one and it shakes back. And I'm like, well, I still got the mercies of God. I still, got the, I still am not getting what I do deserve because I've got the mercy of God. I'm not getting the punishment I deserve. I'm not getting the exact recompense for my deeds that I deserve. When I go to him and I, and I have sinned, sinned in my life and I go to him and I confess that sin, what does he do? What is he faithful and just to do? And do what else? Amen. He's, he's faithful and just to forgive us of those sins and then he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And what does he do with those sins? How far does he cast them? As far as the east is from the west. Now see, you know the word. You know the word. We know the word. Now we need to start living in the word. We need to start applying the word. We need to start speaking the word. 
We need to start proclaiming in my life and the lives of my family and the lives of those that he, he sent me to pray for and to have charge over. I need to start speaking what his word says about those people and about those circumstances. The time when, when we were broke as we could be and, and, and Deb was worrying and saying, Honey, what are we going to do? What are we gonna? And I said, About what? She said, We don't have money to buy groceries. We don't have money to buy, pay the bills. And I just said, Oh, no, he's going to do it, isn't he? And I've told this story before, but I love telling it, so indulge me for a moment. <laughs> he's going to do it, isn't he? Who? Do what? God. He's going to let us starve to death. <laughs> no, baby. God is not going to let us starve to death. He hasn't brought us this far to leave us. He will provide for us. Why would we worry? If he cares about the sparrow, and he cares much more for me and you, why would we worry? He knows when the sparrow falls. He knows when a feather drops off of him. He knows the very number of the hairs on our heads. Why would we worry? Why would we think all of a sudden he stopped caring? Why would we think all of a sudden he's going to let us starve or die or go into destruction or go down any road that he hasn't ordained for us? Remember, he created the smith that blows the coals and he created the waster to destroy. There is not one thing that is, that was, or ever will be that was not created by him. The one who loves me the one who lives on the inside of me, the one who does everything to cause me to prosper. So this word right here, find grace to help. Did you know that in the Greek that is, see, I wrote it down somewhere because I'm not, I'm not real good with Greek. Well, I said I wrote it down. I thought about writing it down. I think it's bothea. Somebody, somebody look, can look it up if you want to, but I think it's bothea, the word for help. Uh, to find grace to help us at the proper time. That word bothea comes from an old, uh, it's an old nautical term, and, and it was used twice that I know of in the New Testament, once where Paul was shipwrecked, and, and, and they, they had help, and the other is, it's, it's, it's also translated help here. It's find grace to help at the proper time. And what that is, is when they take with a ship and they're going through a storm, they're going through something really hard and really difficult and the waters are beating it here and it's beating it there and the waves are tumultuous and maybe they're even on shallow ground where it might be the hull of the ship might be hitting uh, the, the ground underneath the water. They take cables and or ropes and they wrap them around the hull of the ship and it's a web of these cables and ropes that they wrap around the hull of the ship and that helps to hold it together so that possibly it'll hold the ship together enough that they'll be able to ride out the storm until they can get to a safe harbor and then repair the, the damage to the ship. And, and what I love about this is it, is it, 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 it magnifies the truth that we know about God that he doesn't cause us to escape from our troubles. He doesn't stop the storms. He doesn't stop the calamity that will come into our lives at times. And if, in fact, he has ordained it for us because he knows exactly what we need and what will bring us to the place where he wants us to be. But he, 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 he encourages us, even in this word right here, that when we're going through these times and you're going through these times and that when we do and because we are and because we have to, we can know that we have a friend. We have one who has gone before that's been through it and that he knows the feelings of our infirmities and yet was without sin. We're talking about Jesus, the high priest that we just read about, that we know we have that friend. We know now that he lives on the inside of us. We know now that that is his voice that is urging us to know what his word says and to say his word and to use that very quick and powerful word of God in our circumstances. And we, we say it and we speak it and we believe it in our hearts. And this is the process of, of us coming to God with boldness, coming to God to receive the grace and the mercy 
to help to cause us to be able to strengthen and gird up this ship that we're on so that during this storm we may not just fall to pieces. That we might strengthen ourselves to, to float yet another day, to sail yet another day, to, to get through this storm today because we're going through it. You're going to go through it. You're not going to escape it. If you escape it, you're not His. If you don't go through what God ordains that you go through, you don't belong to Him. But the good news is, because you belong to Him, He has ordained your steps. He has given you light to see those steps. He has caused you to be strengthened and to be encouraged. He has given you wisdom and knowledge of how to wrap the cords around the hull of your ship to keep it together. And those cords could be the prayers that you pray over your children in the morning. Those cords and those chains, those things that bind could be the devotion that you read, the times that you pray, the times that you fast and pray, the times like for the month of July here, we've been uh, uh, as a state, um, hopefully most of the people have been fasting and praying and seeking God for the direction of our nation and, and, and that those are some of the cords that will bind the hull together. The cords that will bind your hull together with, will be when a husband and a wife or, or having an, an issue with one another and they're at an impasse possibly. And they've said, look, we, we, I, I want to do this and you want to do this. We're in a disagreement. It seems that things are not working out, but let's get together and let's pray. Let's get on our face. Let's get on our knees. Let's pray. Let's seek God. Let's see what he has to say. And then when God speaks to us, we do what God had to say. And we walk in obedience. And, and, and remember that rest that is going to come to people who believe this word, that rest is not, now I get to coast. Now I get to be on perpetual vacation. Now I get to, to, to stop and cease from all of my works and, and I just get to just rest and bask in the, in the sunlight. Not what it means. It means after you have received his direction, after you have and while you are, going through the storm and the difficult thing that you're going through, you're listening for his voice all the time. And he says, get the cords. I'm not stopping the wind. I'm not, so, I'm not, I'm not stilling this, the, the waves this time. Get the cords, boys. Get the chains. Wrap the hull. Do what you know to do. Do what I've given you in my word to do to wrap your ship, to keep it together. I want you to pray. I want you to fast. I want you to seek me. I want you to obey me. I want you to keep working. I want you to occupy until I come. And those are the commands that he gives us. And, and, and we don't hear him stop in the wind. We don't hear him stop in the waves. We, give, we hear him giving us words and giving us encouragement. Do these things that you might get through. And we put our trust in him. We put our faith in him. We put our confidence in him. We give him everything that we've got. Because let me tell you, these are serious times we live in. We, we are in drastic need of a Savior. Now, we got a Savior, and I'm not looking to anybody, any man, to be my Savior. I'm not looking to any person, any man, any party to save this country, because quite frankly, none of them can do it. They don't have what it takes. But my God has what it takes. My God has the wisdom. He has the, the knowledge. He's got the experience. He's got the power. And what he's looking for is a man and a woman and some young people to go to him with all of their heart, receive the grace and the mercy that they need in this time of need, and to, and to come boldly to his throne and to walk right up to him and say, Dad, what do I need to do? Do I need to wrap the hull of the ship? Well, we've already started wrapping, but this is a bad one. We'll wrap it some more. So we wrap it some more. So we go out there and we, hold, and we do whatever we need. We bail water. We do whatever we need. We throw out life jackets or boats or whatever is necessary for those around us. Dad, what do I do? I come boldly to the throne of grace to receive help in time of need, to receive that direction from Him in time of need. And church, if we've ever been in a time of need, and we have been many times, we're in a time of need now. We need warriors. We need soldiers. We need people that are dedicated. We need prayer warriors. We need people that will fast and pray. 
We need servants. We need uh, workers. We need directors. We need peacemakers. You name it, we're in need of them. We're in need of them. We've got, we've got a job to do. We've got a war before us, and we don't have to fear. Though the other side is greater in number, though they seem to be gaining the advantage, what do I have to fear? As the Lord told um, Joshua, and as he told Moses, and as he told Jehoshaphat, and as he told David, and as he told so many others of the kings, don't worry, you don't have to fight this fight. You just need to trust me. You need to believe me. You need to put your confidence in me. I'm not asking you to fight. I'm not asking you to do this in your own strength. I'm not asking you to struggle. I'm actually telling you not to struggle. I'm telling you to enter my rest, which is you're going to obey me. You're going to do what I direct you to do, and I will keep you in perfect peace because your mind is fixed on me, Isaiah said. He's looking for somebody. Is it you? Is it you today? He's looking for somebody that will search for him with all of their heart. He's looking for somebody that in the middle of the storm, don't tuck tail and run. But in the middle of the storm, they stand fast. And they come boldly to the throne and they say, God, what would you have from me? What do you want me to do? What's my next task? Should I sit? Should I wait? Should I be silent? Should I speak? Should I go forward? Should I wait and see you bring the destruction of the wicked? One thing I can know, and I had some more scriptures, but I'm going I'm to quit for the day. But one thing I can know is that as it says in Psalm 91, He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Is that you? Are you one? who dwells in the secret place of the Most High? Is that, where you, is that where you take your refuge? Is that where you go to when you're hurting and, and, and licking your wounds? Is that, is that where you run to when it gets tough? Because that's where you should run to when it gets tough. You don't run to your friends because they give bad advice. You don't run to, 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 to mom or dad or, 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 or you don't run hide in a cave. He that dwells in the secret place. Of the Most High, He who, when trouble, and this is my interpretation, He who, when trouble comes, and trouble comes, <laughs> we're not exempt to it. But when trouble comes, we know where to run. That's the only difference. Who you go through the valley with, Chris? That's the only difference. That's the only difference between us and the world. Who we go through the valley with? Who we run to? Where our refuge is? And my refuge. It's all powerful. I'm not, but he is all powerful. And turns out, he lives inside of me. Turns out, he's given me grace and mercy. Turns out, he's given me strength. Turns out, all I have to do is speak his word. And his word anoints, and his word breaks the yoke, and his word brings a shield. And a comfort. And his word causes peace. And his word causes a storm to be stilled when the proper time is. But we find grace to help in the proper time. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Don't know if I said everything I was supposed to or said some stuff I wasn't supposed to. But I'll leave you in charge of that. And I know, God, that you'll cause this word to go where it needs to go to find the right heart, the willing mind. The one that will and can receive it right now. And maybe for the one who can't receive it right now, you're preparing their heart to be able to one day to get on board with coming to you with all of their heart, coming to you with boldness and confidence, with Jesus on the inside and saying, no matter what assails, no matter what comes, no matter where you lead me, God, I will be able to walk with strength and with dignity. I will be able to walk with confidence. I will be able to walk with your peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah.
Amen. Amen. We certainly will. And don't know what God's plan is for him, but we certainly will pray. Absolutely. Brother Ken. Yes. Did, did you, uh, just one second. I just wanted to mention, too, that my nephew Johnny is coming here to preach in August. August. Somewhere around there, middle of August. The man that, that reminded me of the man that wrote, uh, Charles Wesley, the man that wrote that song, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, that the Neelans, the people who were killed in a plane crash uh, Friday, really brought that song to popularity back in the 70s, 80s, somewhere in there. Um, uh, Charles Wesley wrote that song when he was having a bout of pleurisy, and, and he said, Oh, th for a thousand hands to raise, and, and he, he couldn't even raise his hands during that time. Um, and so sometimes when we go through struggles, um, whether physical or whether something more external, um, there's a reason for that, that God sees and knows far beyond what we know. And then, and then one day we're like, wow, God, you really were in charge of all this. You really did know about his sickness and his problem and there you know all the issues that we have and and he works it out it's like a it's a, a perfect orchestra that we, we don't know what he's doing when he's doing it sometimes but but we know that he does and that he's faithful amen and and that just gives me such confidence i mean why would we fear why would we fear if we've got that on the inside of us it's like it's like when when jesus i thought i was done preaching Y'all get your Bibles out again. When, 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 when Jarius, Jarius came to Jesus and, um, and his daughter was sick. And he said, Jesus, I need you to come. My daughter's sick. And, and they kind of got sidetracked with the woman with the issue of blood before they could get to Jarius' house. And, and, and while all this was taking place, the girl died. And we're like, man, she died. Never mind. And, that, and some of them even said that. Don't waste this time. The girl's dead. And Jesus says, she ain't dead. She's just asleep. Well, she was dead as far as what we know. But from what he knows, she ain't dead. She's just asleep. And, and, and he asked, he said, do you believe? Do you, do you believe? Can, can, can you accept this? And he had to put everybody out of the room except those family members and the, the ones that, disciples that he brought with him. And he said, this girl is going to live. And he spoke something to her in Aramaic and that, that she should rise from the sleep. And she did. So, you know, maybe your situation is not dead. Maybe it's not hopeless. Just, I mean, it looks like it. And by our definition, it is. But maybe it's not. Maybe God can revive. I don't know what His particular will is on every particular situation, but we just need to put our trust in Him and, and stop, stop trusting what we see and just any and everything that we hear. Put our trust in Him. You got, you got a confidence. You got a hope. You got the song we sing. You got a lion inside. The lion of Judah lives on the inside of you. And what confidence that that brings us. Man, why don't you just walk around this borderline cocky just all the time? Because <laughs> Jesus lives on inside of me. Did you know that? Did you know that? In closing. <laughs> hey, now. <laughs> Easy. Yes, ma'am.
So if anyone wants to like help like the queens or anyone else that wants to like do it whenever she is okay with it, um, she'll basically tell us what to do and we'll just spend the day doing that. Um, so if anyone wanna help, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, awesome. Praise God. All right, teens, you heard that. And anybody else that wants to help, you don't have to be a teen. You can help. Yes. Okay. All right. Seven, seven people, right? So only, uh, only Autumn, if her name's right, Amber was killed. Autumn is the daughter that's left. She and her husband chose to drive. They were flying to go on the, to meet the people to go on the Bill Gaither cruise and uh-huh. go to uh, Alaska and sing. You know, all the singers were going. And so that many, yeah. and she's the only daughter and the only person to deal yeah. with all of this. You know, there's yeah. her mother, daddy, sister, her husband, and all that. That's a big that's a big loss. A big, big loss. Yeah. Question, but, so I'd like to remember her. Man. Carol, would you mind praying then for us? For if you can remember whatever was said, and if not, that's okay. The, the Lord knows. Amen.